Hey guys, welcome to another episode of By Maros Podcast. My today's guest is Francis Lincoln, or Frank, aka Mr. Orange. I almost met Frank personally in a Tony Robbins event in Miami. It was like three years ago when, when Frank was engaged as a representative of Orange Color, which on a scale of consciousness meant like the, the, the people who are driven and the people who are really entrepreneurial. And he was doing this role play with, with the other guys in front of the crowd of 4,000 people. What I, really, what I really enjoyed about Frank was his, his, ability, his ability to be direct and his ability to be really assertive, but at the same time with this like loving tone in the voice. And then I realized that he's also an entrepreneur, a successful serial entrepreneur who launched many businesses, multinational businesses that sold to, to other companies and has a decades of entrepreneurial, of, of a successful entrepreneurial track record. So I'm excited to have you here. Welcome. And how are you doing? Good. Hey, Mark. All right. Thank you very much for having me on your podcast today. Um, I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to meet you personally, I think three years ago, but there were, what, 5,000 people, some 80 countries, Something just like a that. ridiculous amount of people in the room. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But what a fun event. What a really fun time. Yeah. I really enjoyed that time. I think it was like six days, but it really, it really made an impact on me. I can oh, It felt like it. forever. I mean, you're up all night. It's cold in a room, you know, <clears throat> six straight days. I mean, it's not, it seemed longer, but <laughs> quite honestly... Yeah. It was, uh, it was an intense amount of time. Yeah, it was really fun. It's funny. I think I did the most push-ups I've ever done in one day. I think it was the second day because it was just so ridiculously cold that I, in, in order to warm myself up, I just did push-ups again and again and again. And then like a, like a little, I had a little crowd with me afterwards because like people realized that this actually helps, like doing push-ups. So it was yeah. like a little gym at the Tony Robbins event. Well, there you go. Just knock the heat down in your place all the time, right? And keep it nice and cold and you'll be doing push-ups. You'll be really jacked and buff by the end of the year. <laughs> yeah. <All> right. <laughs> so I want to start with your story. Tell me something like I, I want to know deeper. I just found very brief information about you, like how um, I want to know more about the businesses you started. How did you discover your entrepreneurial talent? What was the first company? And how did you come to the place where you're right now? Well, I think, you know, really what it started with me, entrepreneurial, I have to thank my mother for because when I was eight years old, my mother said, and I remember it distinctly. It was like, if you want things, you're going to pay for them. You're going to earn them yourself. And so she had me out on the streets delivering the Boston Globe newspaper for eight years from the time I was eight years old. And the Boston Globe delivers every single morning, 365 days a year, regardless of the snow, regardless of whether it's your birthday, it doesn't matter whether it's Christmas, you get up and deliver newspapers. And I lived in Boston. And so, you know, it was cold, it was snowy, it was rainy. And 4.30 in the morning, you get up and become a paper boy. <clears throat> and so I got a taste for, you know, going out and getting customers and ma managing my money and making sure I went and collected my money and, you know, giving my customers good quality service, right? And, you know, you, you learn, they're, granted, they're tiny little business tips, but when you learn them at an early age, they become important. You know, when if the papers get wet, the customers don't pay. If the if you don't do a great job, you don't get a big Christmas tip. If you don't, or you don't get any tip, right? You don't get that special um, gift. <clears throat> and so that transcended into, I just liked money. So when I was a kid, I would do anything. I would mow lawns, I'd rake leaves, I would shovel snow, um, paint houses, whatever somebody wanted me to help them do in the neighborhood, I would do. Um, when I joined, when I was in high school, we had this thing called the Catholic Youth Organization, CYO. And every year we put on a big production, big musical production <clears throat> for the church. Well, I'm not, a, at the time I was pretty shy and I wasn't really an outgoing actor, but I was pretty artistic. So I drew all the back scenes for the, and painted all the backdrop scenes for the show. But when we sold tickets to the show, we had a program and, and the school was like, you know, you can earn money towards a trip on this thing. I said, all right, what pays the best? What makes the most money? in the least amount of time that I can do for this trip. And I said, well, if you sell the program and create the program, we could put advertisement in the program. I'm like, all right, that's what I want to do. So I sold the front and back covers. I filled up all the programs. I went door to door with stores. I was only 15, I think at the time. <clears throat> and I got them to advertise on this program and all the money that I got, I raised for doing this. I was able to, <clears throat> excuse me, 
just getting over a cold. Um, I was able to uh, go to Disneyland for free because of all the money. And then, then I would win, I would enter contests. The YMCA would have something raising money for muscular dystrophy and sell candy. And I would go out and sell candy door to door. And so I learned how to, to pitch. I learned how to have manage inventory. I learned, how to, I didn't know I was doing all these things. Right. Yeah. You know, these are entrepreneurial skills that you go at the time. It was like, it felt like begging, felt like crying. <laughs> it didn't feel like selling. <laughs> You know? yeah. Like buy the fucking candy, please. You know, I need to make a sale. <laughs> it's funny. It's a big like, picture. Like Disneyland is a perfect motivation for a fifteen-year-old. Like it, it's. Oh hell yeah. yeah! Oh yeah, yeah. You know, you're in high school, especially guys, right? I mean, you're fifteen, sixteen, and it's co-ed trip, and you, oh my god, you finally get to meet that girl from the high school that you really like. And, mm. <clears throat> so yeah, and you're the big deal because you get you got it for free because you're Mr. Salesman, yeah. right? That's what stuff going. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so I always had a, an affinity towards business and I always had, I always knew it someday in my life that I would own a company. And I guess I started my official first company when I was 26. Um, I used to work selling automated test equipment for a very large company in Massachusetts and they, they were just under a billion dollar company. And I was young and I, and I, I got the job as a technical product specialist, but <clears throat> which meant I would demonstrate the machines. And I wasn't all that good at that, uh, but it was part of the sales process. And I would go out with the sales guys and the sales guys would uh, basically take and pay people to go to lunch. That's all I looked at them guys. I like, wait a minute, you get paid, you got a company car and you get paid to talk. That's all you do. I do all the heavy lifting. I do all the demos. I do the technical stuff. I do the, you know, and you get make more money than me. I said, I, <laughs> I want to be a sales guy. That's what I want to do. They make the bank. So I became a sales guy and I was the youngest and most successful sales guy in the company at the time. Mm -hmm. So I got a knack for even more. And when I was 26, I decided uh, to start a company with another former employee from the company I was with. And we decided to sell used equipment. So instead of the new gear that I was selling, we sold it used and competed against the company I actually had hired. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was my original company. Uh, it was in the equipment space and then that grew uh, to a point where we were selling multinationally and buying equipment in different countries and i had partnerships in in an office in glasgow and some offices in mexico and you know partnerships in shanghai and singapore and <clears throat> it, it just started to evolve uh, almost to the point actually that it, it over consumed me um, i then got a taste for well as i as i got older i had different needs you know you want to buy your first house or you have kids and you know you start thinking about college education or things that they need and what i would do is when i when i came up with an, a a big bill let's say a big house or whatever something i wanted i would start a company to go make the money to go do it so i started a software company strictly for the put my kids through college fund that was it that was the only reason i wanted to start it and so i started a software company that supported the machines i sold i had a service company that sold spare parts for the machines i sold I had an auction company that helped me sell the machines I sold. So everything was kind of intertwined into things that I knew. <clears throat> and I guess if there's a lesson to entrepreneurs out there, it's, you know, stick with what you know. Uh, you know, if you don't know anything about being buying and selling real estate, don't be a real estate guy. You know, if you don't know anything mm -hmm. about, or, or specifically, if you don't have a passion, I guess really that's the bottom line. If you don't have a passion about it, because you can learn anything. But if you don't have a passion about what you're doing, you just think it's a good idea, you just think it's a way to make money, it's probably a loser. And it's probably going to fail in the big picture because you've got to really have some passion about it. And in my, you know, in today's day and age. It's like it's very likely that there's, there's going to be someone who is less knowledgeable than you are, but more passionate. And this passion will drive him all through the obstacles that you won't because you don't have the energy to go through. Well, exactly right. You know, that's exactly right. And, and, you know, I look at young upstart entrepreneurs right now and, you know, you, you look at how, how they're making money on the internet and it's, and it's crazy. And it's mainly because of just, again, their passion. I like what I'm doing. I, I do it consistently. Um, I, I'm, I'm convincing, you know, I'm charismatic and thus that whole recipe just comes together and guess what? The dollars start to flow. Mm. So yeah, I'm overwhelmed. I'm not overwhelmed. I'm just highly impressed with people that are starting businesses now, <clears throat> especially in the inter internet and digital space, digital marketing space. Uh, just purely on a concept. Um, and that's how, you know, as we've evolved and you're alluded to the whole Mr. Orange thing, 
you know, that's becoming a, a business generating revenue through the web and through presence, you know, in social media mm -hmm. um, as a kickstart from a Tony Robbins event. Yeah. I think you really took the most out of it. Like I, I think I added, added you as a friend on Facebook right after that. And I could see the post like Frank, AKA Mr. Orange. And it always reminded me of, of, of that situation and of the message that, that was, that was on through that. And I like how you just expanded on it all the time and how you took that little, that little segment and you just dive, like you just made zoom in it and you went through various aspects of what it means to be, what it means to be in orange, which is driven entrepreneurial and so on. And also when you were talking about like the, the, the beginnings of your, of your career, it reminded me a little bit of Richard Branson and how he lived his life early on. How I'm not sure if you're familiar familiar with him or his life. Very much so, yeah. Yeah, he basically what he says that he did all these little things and he enjoyed his time. Like they launched the magazine, they launched the media company, and like like also like like small things like going door to door sales and they were having fun and that's how he learned all the fundamentals which you described as well. And the best thing about it is that you learn all this without knowing that, knowing what you're learning later for, for life. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. You know, you, like I said, you know, you learn all the different aspects of being an entrepreneur, the, the drive, you have to do it on your own. <clears throat> you know, I used to hate it when there would be these charity events at school, right? And they would say, okay, you're going to have to sell these crappy chocolate bars. You have to sell tickets to this book booklet or whatever right and there'd always be a two or three kids that would win because their parents would take all the stuff to work and sell all the shit for them right <laughs> and, and it always pissed me off i'm like wait a minute i'm busting my ass and these kids you know have their parents go in and basically buy all the stuff that they need right drop a thousand dollars on these tickets or candy bars or whatever right and the kid would come in first place and i'm like no i'm not doing that so my parents never went and sold my stuff for me mm. i'm like i'm gonna do this on my own and if I don't win, I don't win. But, you know, at least I'm going to give it the best effort. And, and that wasn't pushed on me. That, I guess that's just an inherent drive. Once you get a taste for something that you like, and I liked things as a kid. You know, I wanted a bike. I wanted a nice bike, right? I wanted a car. When I turned 16 and a half, you could drive and get your license in the States. And I, you know, I wanted a car. So I went out and bought my car, you know, with money that I earned. You know, I put myself through college. I paid for, you know, I just, the things that you want were, that, that drove me. Mm -hmm. um, and knowing that I could achieve it by just, you know, working the extra mile or go driving the extra mile, working the extra hour uh, and trying to make it fun, trying to make it entertaining. How do you so, prevent from, how do you prevent from getting stuck? Because many people want to start their own businesses, want to become entrepreneurs, but they come to a certain point when they, when they come into perception that they're stuck and there's something that cannot be over, overcame and, I would just call it stuckness. How come? Well, stuck, the, the, yeah. Stuck is a mental state. It, it really is. It's not a statement of the heart. It's not a statement of drive. It's not a statement of um, adrenaline. Okay. It's a statement of the head. <clears throat> and the reason people say that they're stuck, when you ask them why they're stuck, a lot of people's first answer is, I don't know. But they use the words, I don't know, so frequently in their life that the universe supports that statement. When you put out there, I don't know, guess what? You're giving yourself a good excuse for never having to know. You're, giving your, you're blocking all possibilities of an answer to come to you because that's your affirmation. I don't know. And we've become so comfortable with saying it and accepting it as an answer that it's become part of just conversation now. Everyday conversation. Hey, Mara, how are you feeling today? I don't know. You know, a little, well, you know, you know how you feel. Mm. <laughs> it's not an I don't know answer, right? But I said to you, hey, what do you want to do? What's your dream? What's your, what's your one year dream? I, 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 you know, I don't know. Bullshit. You know what you want. You know what you want. If I was to reframe it and say, listen, assume all things are possible. Assume that you have all the money in the world that you possibly need to start whatever business it is you want to do. And, and every single job, every, not job, but every single career, it was both fulfilling, it was financially rewarding, it was, it was everything that you could think of positively for starting something. Including if, if what you like is to sweep the stadium, right? If you want to go and sweep the biggest soccer stadium, you want, wherever, right? You want to go to Wembley or whatever. You want to come to the United States and sell peanuts at the Super Bowl. 
I don't care what it is, right? You want to walk dogs. You want to paint walls. You want to, you know, whatever it is, you know what that burning deep desire is. Because when you're five years old, five-year-old can answer that all the time. What do you want to do? I want to be a fireman. What do you want to do? Oh, I want to be in the circus. Oh, I want to be, I want to be a play for the New England Patriots. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Kids know because they don't have a filter. As you yeah. get older, you start adding all the, well, that's a great idea, but, you know, can't do that. That's a great idea, but, uh, you know, and you make up all the shit in your head of why you can't do it. So that's what gets people stuck is they, they, they start thinking in terms of, I can't make money at that because, and then it's some laundry list of shit, right? Or uh, I'm too old, but, you know, they don't say these words, but this is what they're thinking. I'm, mm -hmm. too, I'm too young. I don't have a college degree. I don't live where you live. I don't have the money to, to start it. I don't, blah, 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 whatever the mm -hmm. bullshit line is, right? And it's all bullshit because no matter what you do, look around your room. Look around your room. You'll see a chair. You see earbuds. You see a smoke detector. You see a door. You see paint. You see, and somebody's a millionaire at doing that stuff. And somebody loves selling smoke detectors. And somebody loves selling earbuds. And somebody yeah. loves giving haircuts and <laughs> putting up screen doors, okay? And they are the best in the world at it. And they're sitting on their yacht right now laughing. Okay. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> well, it's true, right? It's yeah, true. Absolutely. Somebody's going to be the best at every, everything you look around at. Somebody's loving that. Somebody's loving plastic bags right now. I'm just going, oh, going all the way to the bag, man. Plastic bags. <laughs> <laughs> I could give a shit about, about that. So, <laughs> anyways, once you get into that headspace of, I really have a lot of passion about this. And what I coach people to do many times is I'll say to them, look, Go out and ask 25 of your best friends. Ask them this question. If you would give, if you would use me as the answer to the question, what is Maros really good at? Like he's so good at it that if he had to, he had to charge you for it, you'd pay him. Like, is he a good cook? Something you might not even do as a career. Is he a good cook? Is he a stylish guy? Does he know how to dress well? Is he outgoing? Is he a good speaker? Uh, does he, is he good with kids? Is he great with animals? Uh, does he know how to close deals? Is he efficient? Is he organized? Is he romantic? Is he, what is it about this guy that he knows so much about that if I had to pay him money to learn it, he could teach it to me and it would be worth the money. Mm -hmm. well, you know what, if you go out and ask 25, 50 people that question, you're going to find out some things about you that the rest of the world recognizes that you're really good at, that you may not recognize you're really good at. And guess what? If they recognize that you're really good at, they'll probably pay you money to continue doing it with you. And I think it perfectly, it's perfectly aligned with this thing you were talking about earlier about being stuck. Because in the end, that being stuck becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Because some might have told you that when you were young, like five, six, eight years old, and then you were repeated to it so many times that it became a conditioned response. And you believe it so much right now that you don't even see beyond that there actually is this talent. So other people right. can help you to recognize that. I think it's an excellent correct. exercise. Yeah, correct. And you know, here's the other thing about it, right? As we grow up, um, I learned this at a, a, a seminar called Landmark Forum, which I highly recommend it. I only done one, but it was really, really good. Um, and the one big takeaway I got from that seminar was throughout life, we have events, right? Events that happen to us. When we have that event, we put a meaning to the event. For example, you're five years old, you go into a brand new school, you sit next to this girl, <clears throat> and you know, you, you, you see this girl, and the only seat really available is next to her, but you're a little shy, so you walk up to her and you go, hey, can I sit in this seat? And this little girl goes, no, that's for my friend. And she's a little mean to you, right? So that's the event. This little girl barks at you. And the meaning you put to it is, man, girls are mean. I don't, I don't know if I want to talk to girls. They're mean. Then you go home and you tell your mother about it. And she goes, well, you were probably being rude. Well, she's a woman. She's a girl. Boy, girls are mean. And maybe they're right. My mother would know. She's right. So I guess I was mean. There's another meaning to the same event, right, <clears throat> that I start stacking. So girls are mean and I'm mean to them. Um, then as you get a little older, right, you want to ask a girl out to the high school dance or something, and she says no, or she rejects you, and she rejects you because of what you're wearing, or she rejects you because you're too short. Well, the event was similar, 
Now I got another meaning. So I keep adding all these filters on my eyes. It's like taking another pair of glasses and putting it on. Take another pair of glasses, put it on. Mm. Right? And I stack all these meanings. Now I'm 30 years old. I want to start a company. <laughs> People go, hey, you're really good with styling hair for women. Oh, man, I, you know, I can't do that. Because you stack meanings of what it is to work with women or be with women or whatever. And they're all just an event. So in life, what would be awesome is to, is to recognize we have events in our life. Great. They're never going to change. The outcome never changed. The, the, the situation never changed. And that's the one thing you cannot change is the event. Great. So compartmentalize that. Put this aside and say, this is the event, but I can change the meaning. The meaning that I choose to give it today determines my future moving forward. If I want to stack all this shit in the background, well, that's kept me stuck. Well, it's, I have total control over that, yeah. right? It's kind of like what we learned to date with destiny in the seminar that we met is that <clears throat> there are three parts to our, what's called the triad, right? One part of it is our self-talk. The biggest part is our physiology. And then our third part is our focus. What are we focusing on? Well, if I'm going to continue to focus on the shitty meetings that I've put to an event, then I'm going to have shitty outcomes. Mm. so change my meaning change my focus change my language yeah. change my triad you, mm -hmm. what do you do when you get when you get stuck with the emotion like you feel i don't know like certain sadness or certain shame to an event and it feels like it's impossible to overcome that and even if you change like even if you change the physiology you go for a run you try to change the focus you meditate it somehow seems not to work again and again and again have you have you experienced this sometimes yeah yeah <clears throat> um I have. We, we've all been stuck. And I think if you're successful, well, I know if you're successful, you're successful because you're taking chances and you're successful because you're putting yourself out there. And that doesn't mean you're hitting a home run every single time. You're going to fail a lot. You probably successful people fail more than others because they try more than others. They attempt more than others. Their failure record is higher than most people's attempt records. Okay. So <laughs> that's a nice way to put it. Uh, <laughs> it is. And, and um, and I think it's, you know, yes, physiology, sometimes, you know, stand up, rah, rah, make your move, all that, go for a run. That definitely helps. <clears throat> and when you're in that place of peak state, if you will, when you're in that place of greater self-talk, you know, what's the primary question you're asking yourself? What are you saying to yourself? What are you, what are you projecting, right? Are you focused on some garbage or are you focused on what you're grateful for? You know, try to, what I do when I'm in a bad situation is I try to reframe it and say, okay, this sucks, but compared to what? Compared to what? You know, mm -hmm. I just got a brand new grandson. He's only a month old. Well, if my grandson was in intensive care right now, none of the bullshit in my life would matter. Yeah. He would matter. If my children were sick or my children were dying <clears throat> or my children were like in some grave problem or well, my parents Compared to that, everything else is pretty minimal, right? Yeah. Law of relativity. So, yeah. And, and so I think you really have to put things in perspective, right? A lot of times we get upset at what I call mosquitoes at our picnic. A mosquito at your picnic, if you're going to prevent playing an outdoor event and you live someplace where it's kind of humid once in a while, <clears throat> okay, that means it's going to be mosquitoes. And you go and plan this big event and you're like, I'm committed, it's a birthday party, graduation, wedding, whatever. And at the wedding, there's mosquitoes and they're aggravating, right? Do you cancel your entire event? You go, oh, fuck it. This thing was a total failure. <laughs> <laughs> you know, never do this again. No, you don't. They're aggravating. But in comparison to the entire event, okay, they're just little nits and nats of problems, okay? Yeah. <clears throat> and we can focus on that little problem and make it the entire event. We can make the entire event crappy because this little thing happened. <clears throat> Excuse me. But that's just us getting caught up in focusing on what's wrong. If you focus on what's right and compare it to what's wrong, okay, focus on what's important and compare it to what's wrong, 99% of the time it'll override what's going mm -hmm. on. You know, another thing too, this is a good point. I just want to make this one other point because I, I, if I was to ask you, how right is your gut feeling? What would your answer be percentage wise? 
Got, well, I would say, like, I would say 100%. I, like, I have my own logic behind that, but I would say 100% based on what I believe in. Okay, so your gut feeling is 100% right. Yeah. Okay. If you went to Las Vegas and there was a table, and the table said gut feeling, and you got to bet, because in your case, it's 100%, right? So you put $5 down, you get $10. It's 100% right. You would never gamble at any other table, right? Hell, even if it was 70%. Yeah. If you went to Las Vegas and you had to put all your money down on one table, one vet, <laughs> and the table was called gut feeling, your gut feeling. Yeah. No brainer, right? No yeah. brainer. Absolutely. Yeah. But yet you leave Las Vegas and the gut feeling table and somebody says, hey, let's start this business. And your gut feeling, which is 100% right, goes, oh, yeah, fuck yeah, let's do this. And then you don't do it because the zero percent, the one percent <laughs> little mosquito at your picnic <clears throat> was going, oh no, you're too young, you're too old, you're too uh, whatever, something. You know? Yeah. Something. And you pay attention to it. And then you take all the money off the table and go, nope, not doing it. Mm. This is a question about intuition. Like like how much should we or, or how much do you in any in your experience? And I guess you answered this question by what you just said right now. Like how much should you pay attention to the rational and to the logical conclusions of your mind? And how much should you actually pay attention to your gut feeling and your intuition, which might be completely opposing the, what, what, what logic suggests? Well, that's a good, word. That's a good question. Um, first, you have to define the word logic, right? Logic is based on when you say, what's the logical answer? Well, logical <clears throat> is still subjective because and i'm not saying you go into things blindly all right i i you know this, there's a reason corporations have board of directors right there's a reason that you should always have a coach there's a reason that you you know should should seek advice there's reasons we go to seminars like tony robbins events it's to learn and to see the things that we don't see it's the things you don't see that will kill you in the end the things that will do the most damage to you. So it's good to know that. It's the reason you get a physical every year, right? Okay, I got some pre-existing condition I didn't know existed. Now it's coming on. <clears throat> or I've got a medical condition that I didn't know was happening. So it's, 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 it's prudent to be smart in advice. However, when you're comparing your intuition, right, as to what's logical, well, now you're making a statement on what's logical. Logical was based on what? It's based on a lot of times, it's based on your limiting beliefs and your experiences. Mm -hmm. I'm making a lo logical decision. Look, I'm, I just turned 60 years old. <clears throat> Logically, I'm probably not going to win a gold medal in the Olympics. In anything. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> I want to give you a chance for chance. <laughs> but, you know, yeah, you're still the chance, right? You never know, right? <laughs> But probability, logically, okay, statistically, it's a very high probability that I won't. Okay, so logically, that doesn't make sense to me, and I, and I won't do that. <clears throat> Excuse me. But logically, if I've never run a marathon, could I start training and run a marathon at six years old? Of course I could. Of course I could, right? Now, there are plenty of people out there that are 60, might be listening to this right now, that go, no, dude, look, your knees gave out. You had surgery on both of them. You know, you're only going to do more damage. You know, why do you want to do that? No, there's, there's a proper way to train. There's a proper way to eat. I mean, it might take me 12 months to get to the, you know, the goal line. Okay, but so what? If I really want to do it, there's nothing stopping yeah. me from doing it. Logically, I can I still do it. Okay? Yeah, I, I see. Makes sense. But like, I, I was thinking about this earlier, and I think there is one more element coming into it, and that's emotions. Like, when emotion enters the game of logic, it can completely it can, can completely change the outcome. And the example I have here <clears> is that if you if you have a day at work and you come home and you're outraged and you, you you're angry, you're just pissed about anything that happened because by some from some reason you didn't manage to express your anger or turn it into courage at work. You come home and your girlfriend makes pizza. You're automatically angry because she even makes pizza when I come home after such a terrible day. Why less? If you had a perfect day, everything works out, you, you, you even won a lottery or something, you're just having the best day ever, you come home, the same girl makes the same pizza and you're excited. Oh, darling, it's gonna be an Italian dinner, or like Italian <laughs> evening. 
so like the the way the the mental state you're in completely changes the way how you see things how you perceive things and what actually enters the game of logic in the first place <clears throat> is that a question or, or just you know how do, how do you differentiate the two because i agree with you it's it's very much state driven yeah it's very much what you, what your focus is on right if yeah. you're having a great day i mean what defines a great day right that's different for you than it is to me <clears throat> you know, it's different from somebody else that's listening. You know, somebody not clearing their throat because they're just sick. It would be a great day. Um, um, a great day, again, being relative to what your definition of great day is. Great day for, you know, somebody in the intensive care unit right now is survival. Mm. Great day for somebody that's in hospice, it might be, and they know they're on their last legs, right, is to see somebody in their family that they haven't seen or be able to say some last words to somebody. Right? <clears throat> a great day for a kid is, you know, getting to play in the mud. A great day for an adult, you know, might be that they land a new job or that they're successful, that they close out the or they get an exercise in or that they ate well. Okay. Um, again, it's all relative to your rules, right? On what you define as a great day. <clears throat> and right. We all have situations that we get upset gets you know we let the forces of the world get in our way mm. we allow that to happen you know nobody can make me pissed off they can say something that i don't enjoy but it's up to me to translate what they're saying and understand okay am i going to allow that to piss me off or am i going to allow am i going to allow them to get the better of me verbally you know that whole sticks and stones can break my bones but names will never hurt me right are you am i, I going to let this like attack on me verbally really upset me yeah. well if it if it triggers something in my past that i have my event that i had i have a meanings and that looks like one of those events the same meanings and yes i i do that I, I might get upset right but i also think it's recognizing when these things happen and practicing being outside your comfort zone like practicing um something different than you did before in the past. You know, if you're in a, in a relationship and I just listened to one of Tony Robbins, it was a little 15 minute thing of a relationship. And he said, when you're in a, a disagreement with your girl, he goes, just love them. No, just, I'm sorry. Just be the apologetic, be the bigger person. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. And, and be vulnerable. Like push past the fear of going, no, I got to be right. Blah, blah, blah. You're wrong. Blah, blah. Prove my point. Just drop it off. Just, hey, you know what? I'm sorry. Yeah. I like, there's been times I don't want to do that. Okay. <laughs> I don't want to do that. I would rather be right. I mean, this is my point. You're going to hear my point. You're going to understand my point. You're not, you know, you're not honoring my feelings. I, I, I didn't get on this whole spun up thing. Right. Yeah. Versus just going, Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Obviously, it whatever difficult. I did, it can be difficult. It can be difficult. You know, one, uh, something I learned recently, <clears throat> and I love this phrase, and I, I'm surprised it's taken 60 years to learn this phrase, because it's so obvious to me. And that phrase is the quality of your um, con quality, the, communica the quality of your communication is directly proportionate to the quality of the answer. Quality of your communication is directly proportional to the quality of your answer. To the quality of the answer, of the, how the other person responds to it. So, ah, so, so, so if I say something and the other person gets upset or the other person doesn't understand, that's not on them. It's on me. I didn't communicate properly. If I communicated it better, they would understand it. If they communicated it better, they would get the results that I want. If I communicated it better, they would be happy. If I communicated better, they would understand. Yeah. So it's, like taking, my so it's like taking, it's taking responsibility. responsibility. Yeah. It's taking responsibility. So in an argument with your girl, right? If you take full responsibility and go, okay, here's, here's the thing, right? <clears throat> and Tony says, as long as you're not, and I agree with this, as long as you're not questioning my intent, and my intention is to be here. My intention is to resolve this issue. My intention is to get past this. You know, and you're not threatening the relationship with, Oh, you do that one more time and we're out of here. You know, mm. that constant finger on the button of explosion, that doesn't work either. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, 
I absolutely agree. I absolutely agree. I just want to add one more thing that uh, I think it's very important that the person actually means it because it makes a really big difference if they say it, but internally they are doing their own monologue and they're like, oh yeah, like whatever, bitch, or, you know, like, like this, <laughs> this thing that, that whatever you say, it makes it completely irrelevant. Mm -hmm. So, it's like, well, you can tell, you can tell in some way, I think it means it or whether they're just giving you that passive aggressive, you know? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You're good. Yeah. You're fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But even that, that's their trigger, right? That's, that's their protection mechanism. That's, that's a learned response that they have, that they do when they get into fear. Mm. You were mentioning when you were talking your story about, about business and how you got where you are, that at one point it almost consumed you. What did you mean by that? Can you, can you go further in that or a little bit deeper? <clears throat> well, yeah. I mean, some people get caught up in what's called, you know, being a workaholic and you know, when you start a business, it's a lot of hours. It's a lot of grind. And when you're in a relationship and that's going on, you need a, a loving and accepting partner. And you need to make sure that they understand that what's in the big picture for everybody, not just for yourself. Um, you know, I can say that my first, when I first started my company, it cost me my first marriage. And it cost me times with my kids that I'll never get back again. You know, when you don't make an event because you're on the road traveling or you don't, you know, you're not participating in something like walking or riding a bike or saying first words and you're not, you're not there to see, you never get a second chance at that. So, so yeah, so I, I was very consumed, um, sometimes to my fault, uh, to create a lifestyle. And I got very caught up on that. I got very caught up on that my self-worth was the equivalent of my net worth. And if my net worth wasn't great, then my self-worth wasn't either. I see. So, yes, you can get caught up and you can get consumed in sometimes the byproduct of what you're doing. What's more important is to stay into the why you're doing it. You know, why start a business? If your why to start a business may be because you want to contribute. You want to create revenue, profits, because you want to contribute. You want to have wealth so that you can do good for yourself and your family. You know, what, what is your why? Why do anything? And if your why is encompassing of your family and your friends and your out in your community, as well as yourself, then that's a noble goal. And, that, and that'll keep you focused on what's important. And it'll help you to avoid, I think, sometimes the disasters of becoming a workaholic. And not to say that, you, not to say that you're not going to work hard. You know, that's, you know, there's no easy free ride. If you're not willing to work hard and have passion and desire and dream for it, you're not going to get there. That's a given. Um, so, I mean, if, unless you win in the lottery, right? That one, one in a million kind of person and they, they happen, you know, they stumble on something and yeah. somebody buys a patent or whatever and they just walk off into the rich land. Right. Um, so what's, what's yeah. changed? Yeah. What's, what changed in, what changed in your life and, and how did your, uh, approach to business changed once you incorporated this belief and this attitude to your, to your work? Well, I think <clears throat> as in life, um, pain can be an unbelievable motivator, right? You know, when you, when you think everything is just going great and then God says, okay, you know what? It's time to give you a little slap of reality here. And they take the legs off from under you. Or your business goes sideways fast because you weren't paying attention or you get a lawsuit you know something happens fast or you come home and your wife says i want a divorce fast right split up everything you own um that's those are those are the times that you know bless you, those are the times that you want to come and, and learn you know those are the that's the growth moment right there there's growth in everything <clears throat> but i think um when you get smacked upside the head, <laughs> you know? Uh, and sometimes for me, at least it was done when I was probably the cockiest, you know, as I, when I was, okay, things are going so great. I'm not paying attention to the details. I'm not paying attention to the KPIs of my company. I'm not paying attention to the, uh, other people's emotions or feelings or needs. And okay, guess what? We're going to give you a knee injury. Oh, guess what? We're going to give you a little bit of close to bankruptcy. Oh, guess what? Your best customer is going to leave. Oh, guess what? Your wife's going to leave. Guess what? 
oh, oh shit, <laughs> guess what? Your kid's not talking yet. <laughs> okay, oh my God, what, what's going on, right? It gives you time to reflect. And, and unfortunately, I think in too many cases and too many with too many people, um, it happens when they hit some pain point, which again is, as I've gotten older, solid reason for me to always have counsel around me, you know, personal trainer, <clears throat> somebody that will talk to me about nutrition, somebody who talks to me about goal setting, business you know, consultants, all those things. I like to surround myself with people that are very highly successful um, so that I can avoid those pitfalls moving forward. Mm -hmm. I see. It's, it's interesting. Like what the, the quote that came to my mind was, I, I think it's Oprah Winfrey who said like, God always keeps talking to you. And if you don't hear him, he's going to send you a message from the external. If you don't read it, He's going to send you a bigger message and bigger message until he sends you an explosive track. <laughs> and, <laughs> yep. and, and then you just have to hear that things and then you have to react somehow. So well, exactly. She's exactly right. You know, eventually you, you avoid it. It's not going to go away. You can't run away from your problems. You can't run away from your situation, <clears throat> but you can, you can't run away from it, but you can step away from the meaning. I'm going to go back to that point that I was making. You can step away from the meaning. What was the meaning? What was the positive meaning? What, what, what's good about this situation? Right? Mosquitoes at your picnic. What's good about mosquitoes at my picnic? Yeah. Well, it makes me appreciate the fact that everybody's here. What's, you know, what's good about the situation right now? Yeah. How can I attract more love, gratitude, inspiration inside of me and others right now? What can I be grateful for right now? Yeah. It's all how you frame the question. Because all we do is ask questions, right? As human beings, that's all we do. We ask, we're constantly asking ourselves a question. Should I do this or should I do that? And people will do more to, like, you know, we've, we've heard people will do more to avoid pain than they will to gain pleasure. Another way to look at that is people will do more to not look bad than they'll do to look good. Is there a way? Does this make me look bad? Uh, maybe, I'm not doing that. Mm -hmm. I see. And and those those that's how you get yourself into trouble, right? Yeah, I like this, like the idea of of. I think it was in some of the books by Tony Robbins that, that basically the whole internal monologue is constantly asking a question and giving the answer, asking a question, giving the answer. And I don't know what to say. I'm like, okay, what should I say now? I don't know. So how well should I take this? You know, like like it, it's it just keeps going all the time and all the time. So by asking different questions, that's the fastest way to be having different answers. Yeah. yeah. I could see on your website that you launched the YouTube channel called Gratitude and you have, you have multiple videos in there, mostly talking about, about gratitude. How, how did this idea came, came up or what's the role of gratitude in your life? Or, um, <clears throat> yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, my buddy and I from Boston, I grew up in Boston and, and one of my, well, actually my best friend, he lives down here in Florida, but he grew up in the Boston area too. And when you grew up in that area, um, <laughs> you, you, as a guy, you show your friends that you love them and you care about them by pushing them into bushes, by, you know, <laughs> t tweaking their ear, by tripping them, <laughs> by making fun of them, <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> little mom jokes, sister jokes, you know, we, we just, that's how you show that you really care about somebody like where I grew up. Tough love. Right? Yeah, it's tough love. Well, my friend Jason and I, we're constantly, every time we're hanging out, we're constantly jabbing each other or pulling the chair out or, you know. I said, and this we're older guys. From, this is Red Cancer, because I could see on your first video, he's like, welcome my buddy Jason, who is, who is not as nice as I am. Or like, like, you kind of just, it just keeps being there all the time. I love that. <laughs> all the time. If there's an opening, you're jabbing it in, right? <laughs> so... Uh, I also like just catchy words. And so when um, one day I was sitting with Jason and I said, that, you know, we should start something. We should do, because I'm big on gratitude. And I go, what about gratitude? That's a cool word. Let's go see if we can buy the domain name. So we're going to buy gratitude.org. So let's start a TV show called Gratitude TV. And we'll just talk about the power of gratitude, but we'll also mix in, you know, how to be an entrepreneur, entrepreneur versus entrepreneur or you know, self-talk or, you know, how you speak into your kids or how do you create corporate culture or how do you raise money or, you know, different aspects of running a business but with the impetus in the baseline of the thing being gratitude. So, so yeah, we just started, we didn't, we just winged it. We basically turned the camera on kind of like we're doing here, right? And just talk. <clears throat> and, um, 
we're overdue to do a couple more because a lot of people really enjoy the channel and uh it's fun and of course then he and i obviously banter he he hates the fact that i wear a baseball cap on backwards and he gives me tons of shit about it <laughs> he thinks you constantly be professional this is not professional so yeah <laughs> so i have to make fun of the fact that his mother dresses him and dresses him funny yeah so anyways it's a it's a pretty cool pretty cool segment though and i appreciate you bringing it up it's been fun i'm looking by the way you know anybody that wants to be on gratitude tv uh, on youtube just let let me know let mars know and we'll uh we'll just film some sessions together because it's fun okay but you gotta be able to bust chops manny if you're not funny you know you can't be on you gotta be able to you know hang okay, okay. <laughs> well considering i saw you i can definitely say that i'm funny <laughs> <laughs> <All right. laughs> okay so and um how about how about the gratitude in general was this something that you discovered after after i mean something that really deepened your practice after you attended the Tony Robbins events or has it been part of your life ever since? I think gratitude, um, sadly, I think it's something that, that happens as you age mm -hmm. more, you know? And yes, I've had 20, 25 years of Tony Robbins events. I started in what, 1997. So what, 23 years of Tony Robbins events. And that's been in the background of my life for almost half my life between Tony and other, you know, highly motivated speakers like Dr. Wayne Dyer and Zig Ziglar and Brian Tracy and, <clears throat> you know, Brenda Burchard, all these people that I've learned from have influenced my life. And I think as you get older, you become, I, I think life just starts getting less and less about yourself and more and more about others. And you start to become a little bit more grateful for the things that you've either had, you've lost, that you've acquired. You don't sweat the small stuff as much as you right. used to. You know? <clears throat> yeah. It's like, you know, I, I always tell my staff when they come in with a problem, I'm like, is this a problem or is this a real problem? Is this a problem you're making up in your head or is this a real, like, oh my God, we better call the fire department. This is a problem. Yeah. Uh, you know? And if it's a problem, come back in here with three solutions that possibly that you can fix this problem with. And then we'll address whether it's a problem. So yeah, I think people, you know, they, they, as you get older, you, when you define what really is a problem, you become more grateful um, because you appreciate, you just appreciate things that you didn't necessarily, you took for granted. Yeah. Right. I think it's extremely important. Like to me, when I, I, like the gratitude was never a daily practice in my life. I, could, I somehow took things for granted. Like some, I wasn't content with some things, with some things I was. But after I discovered the priming, like the, the, the gratitude, basically, the gratitude meditation that Tony does, that Tony recommends doing every morning. I think this is one of the right. things that really started to change my life very quickly. Because once I, once I get myself into this gratitude state every morning, and I could see, and I could feel three things that I'm grateful for every morning with no exception, then it somehow stayed longer and longer throughout the day. And then a funny thing happened was that I realized that I'm out of the things to be grateful for. Because like, after a few months, I was already grateful for everything that I could normally be grateful. And just by simply asking the question, what else can I be grateful for? The answer, the answer just kept coming up. And then it came to an extreme, which was like, what else can I be grateful for? And I started to come with the negative things, like the things I hated before. And just mm -hmm. by again and again looking for the answers i just got the answers and it completely like like healed the healed the the event and the information or like the, the, the situation oh yeah it's it's amazing how many things you're actually grateful for <clears throat> when people start doing gratitude journals i know some people that have coached with me i said okay before you go to bed i want you to write you know 10 things in a journal that you're grateful for 10 10 things yeah 10 <laughs> things it's like oh my god you know they start writing okay I live in a warm climate. Okay, I still have my job. Uh, I'm like, that's it? Come on. How about you sleep in a bed? How about you can write? How about you can read? How about you have eyes? How about you have hands? How about you have health? How about the heart's beating in your chest? How about the fact that there's a person laying next to you? How about the fact that you have sheets and a pillow? How about you know the fact that you live in a, in a free country? How about the, like, let's go. I said, think of it this way. If tomorrow you wake up with only what you're grateful for today, what would you have? 
That's really if you're not grateful for my eyes, I don't get to have them tomorrow. I'm not grateful for the fact that I can breathe, I don't get to have it tomorrow. And I'm not grateful I'm sitting on a desk, I have Zoom, I have a roof over my, guess what, you don't get to have it tomorrow. If, you're only get, if you only get tomorrow what you're grateful for today, I guarantee you, it would take, it would take you all night to go to all your gratitude. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I love right. that, yeah. <laughs> it's a beautiful question. How about your how about your next horizon? What's up to you? Like, was this marathon thing real, or was that like was that an, an example? Are you going to run a marathon? I, I might. Yeah, I actually might. I wrote on my dream board. Um, I did. I did leadership for Date with Destiny this year, so I was not necessarily an active participant. I was, you know, worked on a team. <clears throat> but I decided when I came home, I'm like, I'm going to still do a poster, even though I wasn't part of that whole process. I was helping other people do theirs. Mm -hmm. And on my poster for my goals this year, I did write. I had first written marathon and then I said, no, you know, I don't, I don't want to necessarily commit to that. I want to participate in three athletic competitive events instead. So that be a marathon, that be a Spartan race, maybe Spartan trifecta. Uh, I like to box. So actually maybe boxing six rounds with a professional fighter, you know, nice. be able to last six rounds, you know, that would be cool. Um, you know, something along that, something that challenges me athletically, right? Mm -hmm. You know, play competitive tennis or something that I haven't done. Um, but I have to accomplish three of them this year. Yeah. So that opens my mind up to lots of possibilities. I see. If you did triathlon, would that count as three? No, that would count as one. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so you would make yourself, you would make it harder for yourself. <laughs> yeah, that, uh, that, I could justify it. Oh yeah, I did triathlon. It's three. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love triathlon. That's like, you know, if I, did a, if I do a marathon, well, I did two half marathons. Uh, that counts as two. <laughs> <laughs> no. How about, I, how about this, like, the concept of retirement, like do you like you being in your entrepreneurial spirit since your age of eight, do you ever plan to retire? Like, can you, can you imagine such thing at all? Or what would that mean to you? Yeah. You know, I, I think, um, you know, I recently had a big financial hardship, so I'm kind of in a rebuild mode again. You know, I'm not where I thought I would be years ago, but you know, life happens, shit happens. So you, you, you start over and rebuild. Um, but I like business. I like what I do. I like the challenge of, um, especially now where I, I'm, I'm putting a lot of my focus into coaching and teaching. Um, I enjoy that a lot. So yeah, it's, it, it can be very lucrative um, and it's starting to be, you know, but that's not what drives it. It's, you know, I enjoy it. So, you know, retirement is doing what you love. Mm -hmm. And to me, it's not just necessarily having the financial wherewithal to do it. That's an important component. Um, <clears throat> but it's still doing what you love. So, and I love helping people and I love, I love the art of business. I like being part of other people's businesses. I like, you know, help looking at their financials or going through their corporate culture or look, talking marketing plans or whatever sales plans. I enjoy that. So no, I don't think that I'll ever really retire. Although I do, I do have a new grandson and he's only a month old. So who knows? So I'm spending time with him. Like my retirement might be, you know, taking him to ball games or whatever, you know, <laughs> on a regular <laughs> basis. Teach yeah. him how to golf or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> what is it that you like the most about business? This question just came from, from somewhere. You said out of business, maybe, maybe that's why. The, the most fun about business is, uh, is winning. Um, is winning, you know, is going, okay. Because in, in sales, it's a sport, right? <clears throat> to some degree. You know, you have a competitor, the customer, you know, you want to convince that to buy your product or service, right? You, 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 you want to be in such great rapport that they become a raving fan and they just want to do business with you, which is, okay, how can I bring out the best of me? How can I display the best of my company to win? And win means get the order. Win means get, re, get the client, retain the client. Win means attract the greatest employee, right? Win means you know, looking at your balance sheet and going, okay, we're profitable. Win means making money. <clears throat> Win means doing something in your community. Win, you know, to me, the whole, all the pieces of business are fun because there's a, some level of sport in it. Mm -hmm. There's, a, you know, let, how can we raise the bar? How can we change this? How can we tweak this 2% and make that one better? How can we do this? How can we do that? And how does that create a win for us? I see. Um, 
Yeah, and I love conceptualizing. I mean, I'm, <clears throat> I, I have fun with marketing, um, and I just love helping people take a dream and go, okay, let's let's make this thing happen. Mm-hmm. I mean, let's say on your dream board, right? There were three things on it. That's it. And every other day, you worked on those three things. So every other day, one day you didn't do anything on all three of your goals, but on the Every second day, <clears throat> you did one thing on all three of them. You would have a goal. If you look at it, you would have a goal, three goals, and you would have 186 action items under each one of them. Now, I don't know too many people that have a business plan or have a goal sheet that has 186 action items underneath it. If they did, I'm sure they would knock it out of the park on these, hundred, these three goals, right? Mm -hmm. because they actually spent a little bit of time and a little bit of time might be, I'm going to make a phone call. That's check one. I'm going to go on Google and search them. That's check two. I'm going to sign up for this course. That's check three. I'm going to show up at the event. That's check four. You still have 182 left to go. (laughs) Okay. How would you not succeed? And that's just taking a one degree, one baby step, one bite every other day. God, if you did something every day, imagine you probably get five or six of your goals done. Yeah. So that's what jazz, you know, that's when I sit with somebody and they go, I want to start something and I, we create the 186 steps and then do them, <laughs> you know, it's, that's what makes it great. When you, when you say it this way, it sounds terrifying. Like one 186 items on to-do list. <laughs> it, it sounds it terrifying. Look terrifying. It should look like, Oh my God, that's easy. Because, yeah. You know, if, look, you you have a podcast, right? I'm using an example. You have a podcast. I assume that you want to grow your podcast. I assume you want to, um, you know, maybe monetize your podcast or monetize your, your business in some level, right? And this is, an, this is a means to an end. Okay. Well, for us to have a phone conversation, first, you have your big goal, podcast. Okay. Well, <clears throat> second thing is I got to have guests. Okay. Well, So step number one, create list of possible guests. That's all you did. Step number two, make a phone call, invite them. Step number three, they actually show up. Step four, you film it. Step five, you put it on YouTube. Step six, Mm. you put the audio on your podcast. Okay, the six steps done. Yeah. It's moving the ball forward. It's eating the elephant one bite at a time. Yeah. And when you make it so small that it's manageable and doable, and now you start getting excited about it. It won't be every other day you're working on it. It'll be every day. Mm. So it'll be 365 steps, not 186 steps. It'll be 365 because you're so passionate about it. It's like, man, this is awesome. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm actually getting some traction here. And All I right? think it's super, it, it, it's super important just to, to be aware of the progress. Because like, I think when people fall off or they, they just stop, one of the main reasons is that they just don't see progress. So... So they just put hand, put their hands away from it. So even if you make a once like a small phone call or like if you send an email, it still counts. Right. Still adds, right? Yeah. It's still, it's still some effort. And don't, you know, uh, some people fool themselves with, well, I thought about it today. I had a vision about it. I, I was, I, I got in my, I meditated on it and then I don't do shit after that. <clears throat> Yeah, okay, it's great that you were thinking about it, and it's great that you visualize it, but that's not the be-all and end-all. Let's go. Put some real <laughs> measurable shit underneath it, okay? <laughs> Sit around like a whole bunch of mystics and kumbaya. And all. You're not getting shit done, all right? Yeah. <laughs> Let's go. Let's make it happen. Yeah. I think it's like Brian from, from the other episode of the podcast. He, he talks about it, that some people keep meditating, and they keep having like these bliss states where they are, where everything is absolutely perfect and flawless. And then they go out to the outer world and they're miserable because they just okay. like, the, and then they get so attached to these thoughts and concepts and, and, and meditations that they, they just keep meditating more and more and doing less and less in the real world. So, so they have no results. So this is the same thing. It's just like, like they're taking it into a business, I believe. Right. Put some action behind it. Okay. Mm-hmm. Let's just, if you can't measure it, well, if, <clears throat> if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So you have to have, be something that's measurable. Mm. You know, in a state of bliss, okay, it's great. You, you maybe had some clarity on what you needed, and that's awesome. And maybe you sat down and you, and you reframed your brain so that you're grateful now. Or well, you reframed your self-talk as part of your meditation. Or you reframed your focus as part of your meditation. Great. Come out of your meditation. Get up. Move. Let's make something happen. 
Yeah. Okay. I have I have a last question that, that just came to me before we wrap up, <coughs> and that's: Do you see any difference in how how young people today are approaching entrepreneurship as compared to when when like when, when you were my age, which is basically 30 years ago? I like because the world has changed massively, but also the people changed massively. So, what do you see that's blowing your mind today in, in the people that, that do something unacceptable before, like both in a good and a bad way? Um, well, I have I have children that are, are around your age, okay, <clears throat> a little older. One's uh, 24, and. I'm 30, by the way. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah. <laughs> well, I, you said I have my, I have a son who's 37, daughter 36, okay. and a 24-year-old. Um, what I see, and a statistic that I heard, is that the lifespan of the under 30 generation is actually lower than it was the generation prior. And so what that says to me is that you guys aren't moving enough physically. You know, you're not engaging and moving your bodies, you know, that you, as much as you should. And, and you know, everything is convenient. It's right here on a PC or a phone or anything like this, right? <clears throat> Instant life. I mean, Uber Eats and you can have everything delivered in Amazon and you don't have to do anything. You don't even have to go to the store anymore. You don't have to walk to go anywhere. Yeah. So the, the fact that the lifespan is statistically getting less, I think that's sad. And, and, and I hope that that changes around. I hope that there's more energy and more activity. The other thing that I see that I think is a bit troubling is the age at which people tend to stay at home. <clears throat> you know, um, as a baby boomer, one of our faults is that we've enabled our kids. You know, we've, we sometimes have, we had a lot of drive, but in some cases we've created a generation that doesn't need to be as outgoing or doesn't need to be as aggressive or doesn't need because they've had everything handed to them. And so we've done a disservice at some level to, you know, the generations behind us. Um, not in all cases. And I, I'm not generalizing and saying this is an overall statement, you know, yeah. on any level, or even to say that it's the majority. I'm just saying that it's been something that's happened. Mm -hmm. What I love in the generation now is the creativity. <clears throat> I love the fact that, excuse me, the, the, um, the, there's the, the, this is a double-edged sword. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of emphasis on significance. And unfortunately, you know, we tend to live in a society that, you know, people can be internet famous and or they can be phony and they get notoriety for it. They can, they can complain and the complainers are getting more noise than the people that are doing great things in the world. And that to me is sad at some level is that, you know, we're catering to the exception rather than what's good for all. Right, if the, if the ten percent bitch loud enough, well, they make more noise than the ninety percent. Let's just focus on the ten percent. You know, everybody gets a trophy mentality. Yeah. I'm not, a, I'm not, a, I'm not a fan of that. I think winning and losing is important and vital and growing and living. Right, rejection is part of life. <clears throat> get used to it. Learn how to manage it. Okay, not everyone's going to get the big hug all the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, although I do see a lot of creativity in the generation, you know, the under thirty crowd, I do see a dependency still to not spread their wings as fast you know you don't see 18 year old entrepreneurs as fast as you used to see them you see um i remember my my stepson said to me he he said do you know the average age of somebody who stays at home in southern california i was living at the time <clears throat> southern california is 25 years old i'm like 25 years old are you kidding me i go when i was 17 i was out the door couldn't wait to get out the door all right um and I'm like, well, you know, if 25 is the average, guess what, man? Average means some are above and some are below. Guess what part of the curve you fall in? You're below. Get out. Let's go. <laughs> Get something, you know. <laughs> Make something happen. But Gary Vaynerchuk is I, one of my favorite podcasts is listening to Gary V. And Gary's always saying, you know, look, if you're, if you're bitching about your lifestyle and you're still taking money from your mother and father, you know, grow the fuck up and get the fuck out. Go make your own money. Okay. If you're living at home, you better not be bitching about anything. You mm. better be loving life and because they're paying your bills. And if you don't like it, get up and pay your own bills. Make your own life. See what really life is about. And I don't see as much of that at earlier stages, of earlier levels of you know 20-year-olds doing that. <clears throat> There's a little bit more of the me, me, me 
less of the, hey, let's just get out and make, some, make a name for ourselves in, in a real productive fashion. I see. Um, you know, and, and again, I, I love the creativity. There are some workaholics, there are some genius um, millennials. I mean, they, and, and they are, they are taking a lot of chances, you know. Uh, I just wish I saw more of it, I think. You know, people, you know, I, I've been to trade shows in my industry and all of us are kind of like, where's the next generation that's going to come and take over? Where's the next generation of salespeople? Where's the next generation of entrepreneurs? Um, at least in the equipment and machinery and, <clears throat> you know, running electronics factories and, you know, where, where is that? Great mm -hmm. software minds out there. Incredible. And maybe that's the direction we're all going, you know, so that's get a welcome sure. change, right? Yeah, for sure some of them are still living with their parents, I guess. <laughs> some of them still are. You know? <laughs> okay, Frank, thank you very much for your time. I, I really enjoyed this conversation. And if, uh, where, where, could, where could people find you, guys who are listening? How, how can they reach out? Um, well, you can go to themrorange.com, www.themrorange.com. Or you can email me at frank at themrorange.com. Uh, you can also check out our website um, it's called gratitude, T -U -B -E .org. Um, It's a little dated, I'll admit, you know, we need to put some new stuff on there, but yeah, or just through you, uh, you know, okay. hit me up through, through yourself. And again, I appreciate being on your show today. It was really great talking to you. You got a lot of great energy, man. And I, and I like the direction you're going. Thank you, Frank. So have a great rest of 2019 and, and lots of, lots of success in 2020. Absolutely. You too. Make it their best decade ever, right? Stay inspiring, my friend. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> All Bye, right, buddy. We'll see you later.